Okay, let's pick up the second half of our discussion of environmental systems. And we're going to start <clears throat> by really getting into the main thrust of energy, which is looking at thermodynamics, a branch of physics that studies energy and how energy can be transformed. Now, in order to understand the movement of energy, we have to define a system and its surroundings. A system is whatever you're studying. It could be a single cell, an organ, your body, this planet, this solar system, whatever. Everything outside of what you're studying is called the surroundings. Now, the reason we make that distinction is because there's two types of systems. A closed system is a 100% completely isolated system that does not exchange energy with its surroundings. The only place you can get a truly closed system is in an artificial laboratory setting where you can completely 100% isolate that system. Everything in nature is open in which you have an exchange of energy with its surroundings. So it doesn't matter how you define it, your cell, your organ, your body, this planet, this solar system, they're all open. Everything that's a natural system is an open system. Now, I often I use this example. Let's say that you're in a uh, room in your house and the door and the windows are completely closed. And let me ask you, is that an open or a closed system? Well, most people say closed, but they don't realize that there's radiation, light that's coming in from the window, and air is coming through uh, above and below the door. So even a closed room is still an open system because you are exchanging energy with your surroundings. Now, the next thing we want to talk about are the laws of thermodynamics. And remember, we just spent a great deal of time talking about the scientific method. Remember, a law is something that has been proven again and again and again and again and is always right. I think I use the term universal constant. Gravity is a law. Motion is a law. Um, well, thermodynamics has two laws of its own. And the first law of thermodynamics states that energy cannot be created, nor can it be destroyed. All we can do with energy is change it from one form into another. So your body right now is utilizing energy. It doesn't poof, magically create it when it needs it, and it doesn't poof, magically destroy it when it's done with it. All your body is doing is converting it from one form into another. Now, the second law of thermo thermodynamics states that when energy is converted from one form into another, some of that energy is lost to the environment in the form of heat. Essentially, what this is saying is there is nothing in nature that is 100% efficient. If you have an efficient system, that would mean that you end up with the same amount of energy that you started with. The second law is saying, no, no, no you're always going to end up with less than what you started with. Always, always, always. Now, this brings into uh, entropy. And entropy is a measure of the randomness or chaos of a system. We can think about it as the amount of energy lost. Let's say that we have a system that loses an absolute ton of energy. So it's highly inefficient that system would have a high entropy, have a high chaos or disorder. Now we have another system that loses just a little bit of energy. It's highly efficient. Not 100%, but it's highly efficient. That system would have a low entropy. It would lose just a little bit. Now we can also look at entropy in the phases of matter. If we look at solids, liquids, and gases, which one would have the lowest entropy? That's right, solids would. Whereas gases would have the highest entropy, the highest chaos. And so if we go back to chemistry and we start with a solid and we make a liquid, the entropy of that system has increased. Whereas if we start with a gas and we turn it into a liquid, 
the entropy of that system has decreased in changes of phase of matter as well. Now, here's what we've been building towards. How biological organisms convert energy. And there's two processes. Photosynthesis and cellular respiration. Photosynthesis is when plants, and plants are the only ones that can perform photosynthesis, is when they take inorganic substances like water and carbon dioxide, and in the presence of sunlight, they turn it into food. They create simple carbohydrates and simple sugars. So in essence, what a plant is doing is they're taking light energy and they're converting it into chemical energy to create those organic molecules then the, that the plant then uses to grow, repair tissue, reproduce, whatever the plant needs to do. Now I've given you the chemical equation there. Um, uh, photosynthesis is that when the plant absorbs CO2 and H2O in the presence of sunlight, that's an important thing, it makes the C612HO6. This is called a simple carbohydrate or a simple sugar. In essence, it's the plant's food. Plus, it gives off water vapor and oxygen as byproducts. So this is what a plant is doing, converting sunlight into chemical energy. It's making its own food. We cannot do that. And so we utilize cellular respiration. This is when an organism used stored sugars to perform work and release energy. Where do we get those stored sugars? We have to eat something. So through the process of digestion, our stomach absorbs those carbohydrates, those sugars, which then is used by our body to whatever our body needs to do. Repair tissue, grow, reproduce, whatever. Now, here's the interesting thing. The equation in this direction describes photosynthesis. Guess what cellular respiration is? That's right, it's the exact opposite process. So we take in oxygen, water vapor with these stored sugars, and we release water vapor and CO2. So they're, they're exact opposites of each other. This way is photosynthesis, this way is cellular respiration. Now, let's move on to our last natural science talking about biology, and really we're going to talk about ecology. And we're going to break this discussion into two parts. The first part, we're going to look at ecological pyramids. These are the relationships between organisms living in a particular environment and how those organisms interact with the, with the surrounding environment. Now, whenever we talk about this, we also talk about something called an ecological niche. This is an organism's position or role in an ecosystem, and everybody plays a role. You're the E10, you're the e -tors, or you're the decomposers. So everybody has a role in an ecosystem. Now that's going to be the first half. We're going to look at um, what an ecological pyramid is. We're going to look at the different groups. The second half of this discussion is we're going to look at how biological organisms interact with one another. And we're going to talk about the three different interactions. Symbiosis, which is then broken into mutualism, commensalism, and parasitic interactions. Those are types of symbiotic relationships. And then we're going to end by talking about competition and predation. So let's begin. And let's start with our ecologic pyramid. And we're going to start with the most important group on the bottom, our producers, also called autotrophs. For, an, for those of you that know, that prefix auto means self. So an autotroph is something that makes its own food. Generally, it accomplishes this through photosynthesis, but there are plants that use other chemical processes called chemosynthesis. I just wanted to bring that up. Most plants use photosynthesis, but there are others that utilize other chemical processes. We call that chemosynthesis. So what, what, whether you're using photosynthesis or chemosynthesis, 
our producers make their own food. They take those and they make those organic simple sugars and simple carbohydrates. In a terrestrial environment, we have a lot of autotrophs. Everything from grass to flowering plants to bushes all the way up to trees. We also have um, autotrophs in the oceans. This is algae, one of the most important um, autotroph groups in our marine realm. Now, if we take a step up, we get to our next group called our consumers or heterotrophs. These are organisms that have to eat something else to get their energy requirements. Now, not all consumers are the same. There's actually three different levels of consumers. We start off with primary consumers. They're the group directly above the plants. They generally, when you're talking about an ecologic pyramid, you eat what's below you. So primary consumers have plants below them, and so these are typically herbivores, animals that only eat plants. We take another step up and we get to our secondary consumers. Now secondary consumers can eat primary consumers, can be carnivores. They can also be what are known as omnivores, where you eat both meat and plants. So once again, you're eating everything below you. And then we take a final step up and we get to the top of our ecological pyramid, where we have our tertiary consumers. These are our top predators. Now you'll notice there's three pictures at the top there. I have an example of a primary, a secondary, and a tertiary. Let's see if you can tell which is which. The cow would be a primary consumer, okay? Would eat plants below it. Snakes would be secondary consumer, and the grizzly bear would be a tertiary. Now, I want to make sure that you understand this concept, so I want to give you other examples. Let's start with our primary consumers. In addition to cows, what other animals would be primary consumers? Well, horses would be primary consumer, elephants, giraffes would be primary consumers, rabbits would be primary consumers, even some insects, like a cricket that eats leaves would be a primary consumer. Okay. Let's talk about secondary consumers. Let me give you five other examples of secondary consumers in addition to the snake. Lizards would be secondary consumers. Frogs would be secondary consumers. Um, a bird, like a robin, would be a secondary consumer. A lot of insects would be secondary consumers, like a, a spider. And then fish. I always, I always, whenever I think of secondary consumers, I always think of fish and birds they are kind of the best examples of secondary consumers. So like a bass. And then finally, tertiary consumers. Five more examples in addition to the grizzly bear. We have humans are probably the best example of tertiary consumers. Great white sharks, lions, wolves would be tertiary consumers. And in a lot of forest ecosystems, like eagles, hawks, and owls would be tertiary consumers. Okay, so consu consumers, we're all heterotrophic. We have to eat something to get our energy, but there's different levels. So we start with our producers, then we go to our primary consumers, then our secondary, and lastly, our tertiary. Now, there's one other group we haven't talked about, which is very important, and these are our decomposers. These are organisms that break down dead organic material for their energy requirements. Now, just like consumers, they are also heterotrophic. They have to break something down that's dead to get their energy requirements. So the only group that's autotrophic, that has the ability to make its own food, are our producers. Now, decomposers include, probably the biggest group would be bacteria, fungi, like mushrooms or toadstools, and then certain insects, worms, snails, and slugs, would all be considered decomposers because they break dead organic material down. Now, let's take everything that we've learned up to this point and let's actually look at an ecologic pyramid. And so this is an ecological pyramid for, say, a forest ecosystem. So we would include flowering plants, 
trees, grasses, everything that makes its own food, whether through photosynthesis or chemosynthesis. chemosynthesis. We take a step up and we get to our primary consumers, our herbivores. Examples in a forest would be deer, crickets, rabbits, squirrels, even some birds. We take a step up to our secondary consumers and we would see snakes, um, frogs, in this case I think that's a badger, uh, and then we take our final step up and we get to our tertiary consumers. In a forest, a fox, a mountain lion, even an eagle would be a tertiary consumer. Now what you don't see are these decomposers that are kind of outside here and these arrows indicate that they're acting on every single level. So they're breaking down dead plants, dead primary consumers, dead secondary consumers, and dead tertiary consumers. That's why we have these arrows. So our major groups, producers, consumers, and decomposers. Now, I want to bring energy into the discussion of an ecologic pyramid. For every single ecosystem, the primary energy source is sunlight. Think about what our producers need. They need sunlight to perform photosynthesis. So it enters here. The producers then use that sunlight to make their own food. The consumers eat the producers or eat other consumers to get their energy. And then the decomposers break down the consumers and the producers. In each case, when they convert that energy, they're giving off heat. This is the second law of thermodynamics in action. When you convert energy, some of it is lost to the environment in the form of heat. Now, the second half of this discussion, let's look at the different ways that biological organisms interact with one another. And we're going to start with symbiosis. And symbiosis describes a close and long-term relationship between different biological species it is usually the result of something called coevolution. I know we haven't talked about evolution yet, but evolution simply means change. Coevolution is when different species evolve together. So species A goes through time and it changes. This then forces species B to better interact with species A to change as well. So they're not evolving independently of one another, they're evolving together. This is what coevolution is. Now if you look at the pictures here on the bottom, notice the shape of this uh, pistil of this flower and the bird's beak. Same thing over here. Notice the pistil of the flower and the shape of the hummingbird's beak. This be bird can get the nectar outside of this flower. If a bird with a short stubby beak lands on it, it couldn't get that nectar out. And so this is all symbiosis is, a close and long-term relationship between different biological species. Now, there's different types of symbiotic interactions. The first two are beneficial. The first one being mutualism. This is an interaction between two species in which both receive a benefit. In the case I've given you the example of bees and flowers, think about what both get out of that relationship. The bees get food, they get nectar, and the flowers get pollinated, they get to reproduce. So both receive a benefit. The second is commensalism. This is an interaction between two species where one receives a benefit without affecting the second species. So what does the second species get? Nothing. It doesn't get helped, but it doesn't get harmed. It receives nothing. The example I have here is a shark and a remora. A remora attaches itself to a shark and hitches a ride. Now, a lot of people think that the remora cleans the shark they do not. The remora doesn't do anything except, except li, simply attaching themselves to the shark to catch the rut. So the remora gets a ride and the shark gets nothing. It doesn't get helped. It doesn't get harmed. That is parasitic 
relationships in which one species, the parasite, receives a benefit by directly harming the second species, often called the host. So I have two great examples of parasites on the right hand side. The top picture is a tick, bottom picture is a mosquito. So both parasites will attach themselves to a host and suck out their blood. You lose your blood, you are not going to be at an advantage for that. We often call this parasites reduce the host fitness because they lose blood. The other thing that parasites do is they can spread infectious diseases. We're going to talk about infectious diseases when we get to human health and the environment. And we're going to learn about how ticks can spread diseases like Lyme disease or yellow mountain spotted fever. Mosquitoes have been known to spread a wide variety of diseases from malaria to yellow fever to dengue fever to even Zika virus where we had that outbreak a couple years ago in Florida. So not only is the host losing blood, in some cases it may contract an infectious disease. All three of them though are symbiotic relationships. So in every single case one species derives a benefit. In mutualism the other species gets a benefit. In commensalism the second species gets nothing and in parasitic interaction, the second species gets harmed. All symbiosis. The other biological relationships involve competition and predation. Competition is the process by which organisms vie with one another for environmental resources. Now, there's two types. Intraspecies competition involves members of the same species. Let me give you an example. Okay. There are those of you that are going to go out to a bar or a club this weekend. Now, why do you ladies spend hours getting ready, making yourselves look pretty? Because you know you are going to be competing with other females for the attention of the males. Okay? Or the attention of other females. No judgment here, ladies and gentlemen. Okay? That's intraspecies competition. You're competing with the other females for the attraction of a mate. Whether it's short term or long term, well, that's up to you. Okay? Men, same thing. Why do you get, why do you spend five, ten minutes getting ready? Same thing. You're trying to compete with the other males there for the attention of the females or other males. No judgment. You love who you love, ladies and gentlemen. That's intraspecies competition. Now, Interspecies competition involve members of different species. So let's say somewhere out there right now, there's a black widow spider and a scorpion that have both discovered a hole in the ground that they want to use for their home. They're going to compete with one another to the death, and the victor gets the spoils. They get the hole in the ground for shelter. That would be interspecies competition. Now, predation is an interaction in which one species eats all are part of another. And whenever we talk about predation, we always have to talk about predator-prey relationships. In any ecosystem, there's always an equilibrium or balance that is struck between the etors, the predators, and the E10, the prey. Let's use an example. Let's use Yellowstone which back in the day had a thriving population of deer and elk and a thriving population of wolves. I think there's still wolves, but not quite as many as there once was. Let's say in one year, the deer population shoots up because vegetation is plentiful, they have plenty of water, and they absolutely explode. Their numbers explode. What's going to happen to the wolves? Well, their numbers are also going to increase. As their numbers increase, the deer numbers are brought down, and so we establish this equilibrium or balance. Let's say another year, the deer population um, crashes. Not enough vegetation, and they simply can't reproduce. What's going to happen to the wolves? Well, their numbers are going to decrease as well, until once again that balance is struck between the E10. 
Now there is one species that does not strike a balance with their environment. Can you guess what that is? That's right, it's humans. We typically don't strike a balance with our environment, but everything else does. Now there's one last thing we want to talk about before we leave this topic, and this is succession. Think about it this way. In every single ecosystem, the collection of plants and animals that make up that ecosystem continually change. Natural systems are not static. They're dynamic. They're always changing. And so these biological communities, and what a community is, is the collection of plants and animals of different species living together in a particular environment. So these communities change over time. And what you see here is a logical progression. You always start with something called the pioneer community. This is the collection of plants and animals that go into an area first, they set up shop, they colonize the area, and they pave the way for other plants and animals to come in. So you always start with the pioneer community. You then move to the intermediate community or communities. Depending on the ecosystem, maybe there's 10 intermediate communities, maybe there's 10,000. It all depends. But eventually, that those intermediate communities will give way, give rise to the climax community, which is the last and most stable community in an ecosystem. So it's this logical progression, pioneer to intermediate to climax. Now there's two types of succession. We have primary succession. This occurs in an area where there was no life to begin with. Primary succession does not happen anymore because any area that could have been colonized has already been colonized. But think about billions of years ago when the first life on Earth appears as it spread into a new environment, that would have been primary succession. Typically what we see today is secondary succession. This occurs after a disturbance, like a fire or a flood or an earthquake. We wipe life out in a particular area and we have to start all over again. So the pioneer community moves back in and we get this progression to intermediate to eventually climax. Now, here are the two types. So this top picture is primary succession. So once again, to begin with, no life, rocks and soil. The pioneer community moves in, usually composed of liches, uh, lichens and mosses that inject nitrogen in the soil, which allow then grasses, shrubs, flowering plants, eventually trees to move into the area. Now once again, pioneer community then goes to the intermediate communities and there's variable amounts. Each ecosystem may have 10, maybe 10,000, but ultimately you reach the climax community, the collection of plants and animals that is most stable in that particular environment. This bottom picture is secondary succession. So let's say that we started with a climax community that was an oak forest, and the oak forest burned out. You don't see trees the next year because the pioneer community has to move back in you then get the progression to grasses, to flowering plants, to bushes, to trees. And once again, you move from pioneer to intermediate to eventually climax. Now, if we started with a climax community of oak trees, does that mean that this one will be an oak forest? No. The fire changed things. Now, could it be an oak forest? Sure. Maybe we started with an oak forest, burned it down, we get another oak forest. But that fire has changed things. So maybe the resultant climax community is a hickory forest or a maple forest. So it doesn't matter, but that forest has changed things, so we may work our way to a brand new climax community. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of our environmental systems discussion.